Hi everyone, I'm just going to wait another minute or two to get started here. Uh, seems like no one likes to click on a Zoom link till right when the, when the time starts, so we'll just wait a minute or so. Okay, um, why don't we get started? Um, I first of all would like to welcome you to uh, kind of what's become an annual what's new in design safe uh, webinar I gave something la uh, similar last September or so um, trying to kind of give folks an update on some of the new functionalities that we had developed and others that are coming down the pike. Um, and so uh, it seems like a good time of the year to do that. Um, in terms of uh, new students coming on board, the beginning of a new school year, et cetera. Um, and so I appreciate y'all being here and taking the time out uh, to listen to what we have coming uh, for you at Design Safe. So let me uh, share my screen. Um, I have some slides, probably about 40 minute presentation or so. Um, if you'd like during the presentation to, uh, you can ask questions via the chat. There are several folks uh, from uh, Design Safe that are on the webinar and, and can answer in the chat, chat, chat excuse me, as needed, or uh, during the Q&A, you can ask your questions uh, in uh, verbally, you can just unmute yourself. So with that, why don't we get started? Share my screen, presentation, and get that laser pointer started. Okay. <clears throat> Well, great. As I mentioned, I'm Ellen Ratchie. I'm a professor here at the University of Texas. And uh, we, uh, over the last five years, have developed the Design Safe Cyber Infrastructure for Natural Hazards. And I'm happy to announce that uh, we just received our uh, renewal notification. And so as of October 1st, we will be renewed for another five years. So we have lots in store, lots of things coming uh, to bring to the natural hazards community. So uh, some of this presentation will be a little bit of a, a re renew or a, a review for those of you who know Design Safe, but it's always good to, to kind of remind ourselves what we're doing here. So I always start off my presentation saying, what is Design Safe? And I've actually kind of wordsmithed this a bit since perhaps you've seen this before. So what we really are trying to provide is a web-based research platform that enables the transformative research our community wants to do that ultimately will allow us to protect human life and reduce damage during natural hazards events. Of course, that's a big, that's a big ask, uh, but our vision to get that done is to provide a cyber infrastructure that becomes an integral part of the research that you're doing. And with that, we kind of have three main uh, emphasis areas. We provide a platform for data sharing and publishing. We enable research workflows and act, and we provide access to high performance computing and we deliver cloud based tools that support the things you need to do in your research, whether it's data analysis, visualization or integration of various types of data. And through these uh, areas, we, we aim to amplify and link the capabilities of the larger natural hazards uh, engineering research infrastructure network, as well as natural hazards researchers across the US and abroad. We really are looking to affect natural hazards research, no matter where it's funded, no matter where it's happening. So if you look at the, to come to the Design Safe website today, you'll see this, although I will tell you, we are uh, in the midst of redesigning it a bit, so it will look a little different in the upcoming months. But the key here is this is the main area to learn all about NERI. You can find out about the near, different NERI facilities. Uh, you can learn about the large, broader natural hazards community. But in terms of design safe, our main focus is on the research workbench, 
uh, where our data repository, our tools, and, and the like uh, reside. Now, taking a closer look at that, there's really many things, uh, many parts to this uh, area in the workbench, but I, these are the ones that I will focus on. I'll talk to you a little bit about the data depot, uh, some of the new things we have going on there. We'll talk about the reconnaissance portal where you can get access to reconnaissance and field data, uh, the workspace, that's where our tools reside, and then the tutorials and the learning center where you can learn how to do all this stuff. Because this presentation is really just to inspire you uh, to think about what can be done. So if we take a clo closer look at the research workbench, uh, I mentioned these three areas. First, let's start with the data depot data repository. Uh, one thing that's unique to our data repository as to others where you may publish data, we're not just here to publish data, we're here to be part of your day-to-day -day work. So you have access to your own private space with my, where your data, called my data resides. We have a collaboration space called my projects and that's where you can put data, where you can share with your colleagues. And ultimately it's the data in a project that gets published to the publicly accessible space called publish. That's where our curated projects reside. And then we also have an area called community data where less formal data can be published. Uh, so we call it uncurated. Some like to call it the wild, wild west, um, but there are data there. And I'll even mention places today, for instance, where say examples, uh, uh, Jupyter notebooks or scripts or tools uh, are provided. So that's the, the data repository. We'll get back to that in a second. The workspace is where our apps and tools reside, and we have a load of them. Com they do computational simulation, they do data analysis, they do visualization. And importantly, as I mentioned, they can have access to the data depot because we want the research workbench to be a workspace for you. So you need to have access to those files. And then finally, the reconnaissance portal where um, you can discover field data that has been published uh, based on reconnaissance after natural hazards events. And we'll look at that as well. So let's take a look at the, at the data depot. Um, a few things have changed just in the last few months. Um, one thing that hasn't changed, however, is my projects. So these are, this is a listing of the projects I am involved with. I am a team member on all of these projects. Some I'm a PI, some I'm not. <clears throat> some I'm listed just so I could take a look and I'm not even an author when the data gets published. But the key is the data in your projects eventually can be published and not every file has to be published within that data set. I've mentioned before, you can link uh, your DesignSafe account to any of the, these cloud service providers if you use Box or Dropbox or Google Drive. So you can easily move back and forth from those uh, cloud services. And then this is the area where I said the public facing uh, data reside. Uh, one thing that has changed is we have now differentiated the NIS projects, which came from be came before MIRI, from those that have been published uh, through Design Safe, and that's in the published area. And then community data is where that kind of general data uh, and files that you may be interested uh, reside. So again, you can just navigate here. Looks a lot like Google Drive. We got the add and this upload is all up there, and and help down here at the bottom. So um, something that we released in the last few months was a, a more detailed search. Uh, when you go into the published area, you know, we have hundreds of projects. We need some sort of search. So now you can search via author, title, keyword, description. Um, and at some point we'll be adding the ability to say, hey, I wanna look at all the <clears throat> wind projects or all the water-based projects or the earthquake projects. Um, and so there'll be you know, multiple filters that you can apply to find the data that you're looking for. And something that I'm really excited about that we're uh, working on uh, as we speak is to expose some metrics to you. As publishers of uh, data, you wanna know if people are using your data in the same way you would like to know if people are citing your papers. And so uh, we'll, we're going to be uh, exposing metrics such as downloads, as well as views, because not everyone may download a file. And so these data metrics will soon become part of not only um, when you do this search and when you see a project listed, but when you go into a project, you'll even be able to get more detail about those data metrics. 
Um, if you look now, let's just take a look at a published project. Here's an example from my colleague, Scott Brandenburg. Um, and you can see it looks very much like a, a, you know, a paper. It's got an abstract, it's got a title, it's got authors. In this case, it's an experimental project. It's got experiments. Um, it's, you know, I still I'm very love, very much love the, the, gra the, uh, the kind of visual representation of the different levels here. But one thing again that's new is now um, you can download the entire data set. So previously it was a little bit more difficult to download the data set. Uh, you'd have to figure out which files you might want to download. Now you can, it's pre-zipped, you hit download the data set and you get it all. Although you do need to be a little careful because some of our data sets are quite large and so that zip file may be quite large. And uh, of course, our DOIs are now listed not just at the experiment level, but, so they're applied at the experiment level, but all the DOIs that are in this project are listed up top. Um, one other thing that we're, we'll be working on this year is the ability for you as a user to decide, do you want every experiment to have its own DOI or do you want the project to in total to have one DOI? We're gonna let you make that decision. Uh, on your own. But right now, for instance, each experiment gets its own DOI. And then um, something else that I'm excited about that we're working on is version control. Because we all know um, we can make updates, we might make a mistake and want to revise something. Um, right now, if you want to change something or revise something, you kind of have to send us a ticket and we'll help on the back end put the new, you know, swap out some new files. Uh, what we'd rather do is allow you to control it and say, look, I need to make a new version. I'm going to swap this file for that. I'm going to maybe revise the wording up here. And so you'll be able to publish a new version, same DOI, but there'll be multiple versions um, shown on the website. So again, lots of exciting stuff happening uh, moving forward in the data depot. Um, I did want to mention, you know, we do have a, I would like to say, a unique approach to uh, data publication in terms of using data models that are structured yet flexible. Um, we basically have developed five general uh, data models for five different types of projects, experimental, simulation, hybrid simulation, field research, which involves both um, reconnaissance data as well as say social science data that might be taken in the field. And then, you know, if you don't fit into one of these four, you can use the other project, which is a much more free and open data model where we have some basic project metadata required, but after that, it's really just a folder system. And as I like to say, with flexibility comes responsibility. So we do put the onus on the researcher to organize the data in a way that makes sense that you feel that someone coming in to use your data will have the information that they need to reuse it. But we are here to help. And I'll tell you, we're not gonna leave you alone, or completely alone. We are definitely here to help. I did, I wanted to show you um, just some examples of the field research uh, projects. We just, you know, kind of really in the last six months have had folks starting to use that. Um, here's just a mock-up, and what's exciting about this is that it allows us to support integrated interdisciplinary data sets in the field. So perhaps, perhaps you're going to study Hurricane Michael, but you've got social scientists looking at people, and you've got engineers looking at the buildings, and those two things should be related, and in this case, in fact, they are. So if we look at this uh, field research uh, project, again, it is a mock-up. This isn't actually available, but we worked closely with researchers, uh, Lori Peake and Joe Wartman, to put this mock-up together. You know, of course, the natural hazard being studied is indicated, is, and, and the event type, you know, here it's a hurricane. Um, and then the organizational structure is a bit different. Uh, we have missions, which, you know, some people might call waves, some might people um, might call groups, but the key is the mission is a group of data collections that are associated with something that's common, whether it's a goal, like uh, we're all looking for wind damage or a location, like here, Mexico Beach, or maybe time. Mission one happened in 2019, mission two happened in 2020. 
because we're trying to look at the recovery phase or the, how the people have changed or the building recovery, or et cetera. But then within a mission, there are collections and collections are just data that are grouped together based on a shared, shared purpose within the project or the mission. So again, within this mission shown here, it says Mexico Beach um, performed by the rapid and you can see we've got the engineering geoscience collection. So here, this is where they investigated uh, structural damage in certain areas of the coast. And then here's the social science collections where they interviewed uh, children at a shelter and the parents uh, at the shelter. And you know we've got an area where we can put our prep documents. And then we can even have a collection up here that is say the virtual reconnaissance that went on before they went to the field. So many ways you could put these pieces together to really show the data and show the connections to the data, uh, the different collections, et cetera. So we're really excited to see how field research and field reconnaissance teams start using this data model uh, going forward. You mentioned that already. Okay. So like I said, we're, we're, we are giving you some responsibility, but we're here to help. And so we do have curation and publication guidelines. Uh, if underneath the research workbench under user guides, you'll find a data curation and publication area. Um, I did want to point out uh, some information about data transfer methods. Um, you know, you can go, you know, again, you can go to this link to get all the gory details, but just keep in mind, yes, you can use the web browser to upload a couple of files, folder, um, you know, you could do the same with your Dropbox or Box, but once you start <clears throat> starting to talk about hundreds and hundreds of files, um, hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes, terabyte of data. You really want to go to using these advanced tools, which take a bit more um, effort, but they pay off in terms of the speed and reliability. And so Globus and Cyberduck are, are two options, all of which are again described in the data transfer guide. And then I cannot forget that we also have virtual curation office hours. Uh, data, our data curator, Maria Esteva, assisted by Mayar Sharifi, who is a TAC um, a person, staff member, who also has a civil engineering degree, so he understands the data. Uh, every Tuesday and Thursday at 1 central, uh, or by appointment, um, you can just drop in on Zoom and they can look at your data with Maria and Mayar and they can give you advice and thoughts, et cetera. And that is listed under the training center, okay? Uh, one other thing to keep in mind is we're considering and we're planning over the next year to maybe start some office hours, just general office hours, not only curation. But let's say you're having a Jupiter problem and you wanna kind of meet with someone, you can kind of drop in and do general design safe office hours. So keep your eyes out about that. I always have to keep I always have to mention this because I think it's critical as we move forward in, uh, in our community to publishing data and reusing data. We wanna make our data count. We wanna make sure our research is reproducible and our data is reusable. In fact, I've gotten to the point now that all of my students, when they submit a paper, I, have them submit, I also have them publish a data set in DesignSafe that has not just the data, but the scripts, the plots associated with that paper. So it's something I think we should all strive for so that we can really build things up. So that means formally publish your data sets in stable data repositories. I'm partial to the design safe, but there are other ones out there. Zenodo, figure share, or fig share, excuse me. So there's, there's other options there. So um, include, you know, not just data, you can also Put Python scripts, visualizations, et cetera. Um, you also, you know, you could in the past maybe dump data on a website, but websites go away, as we all know. So you want them to have, you want the data to have a permanent DOI, not just a URL. And to show that these are meaningful contributions, I list curated data sets in my CV, just like papers uh, in its own little section. So I think that's important too. And then last but not least, because if you publish data, you want to be able to track people who have actually reused the data. And now, yes, you could look at download metrics from Design Safe. But if someone actually publishes a data that a paper that used your data, you'd like to know the same way you'd like to know when people reference your papers. 
You want to cite data in the same way you cite papers, in your reference list of your paper, using a DOI, the citation, and we, we help you by giving you the proper citation language. So here's an example of a paper I published where we said, look, this approach is implemented in executable Jupyter Notebooks. There's the reference. It looks like a paper reference, but if you go to the references section, it in fact is design safe and it's the DOI to the design safe project. I can't tell you how many times I review papers and people say it's in design safe. Maybe they, in the acknowledgements, they put the DOI or they put it in parentheses, the DOI in the main text. It helps us much better track data citations and data reuse if you put them in the reference list. And as I said, we try and help. So any published data set like this, you'll see this blue button citation. If you click on it, the citation's right there with the DOI. You can either download it or what I do is just copy and paste um, the wording right there and pop it into my paper. So we're trying to help make it easy, as easy as possible. Um, so I mentioned the reconnaissance portal. Uh, again, you get to this from the research workbench. And this is where we show a map where we have archived data sets or reports from reconnaissance events. And it's been an amazing four years of earthquakes and really a lot of hurricanes you can see, um, all of which have data. So you can see, you can, you can click on the map, look at a map point, or you could scroll down or even search the listing uh, just as an example, if you clicked on Hurricane Michael, uh, there's the map pin. The map just kind of generally shows you where things are. Here's the important part, available data sets. And, you know, as of this week, two, you know, about two years later, there are eight data sets associated. So much so I had the screenshot, I had to scroll it all the way to the bottom. Um, some start with the kind of like the preliminary virtual reconnaissance all the way down to the final uh, re recorded uh, and curated data sets, QA, QC by say Steer. And in fact, this data set has street view, LIDAR, images, uh, lots and lots of stuff. Um, so you can see that there's a lot of interesting data being collected and made available. So earlier I showed you this slide. What is our vision? What is design safe? We focused on this first bullet, but I want to say we have to think about the second and third bullet because this is really where we're trying to distinguish ourselves and say from any other data publishing platform. What can you actually do research-wise um, with workflows, computing, tools, etc. And that's where the workspace comes in. So you can see here in our discovery workspace, We've got different tools that are under these general um, tabs, simulation, visualization, data processing, partner data apps, and then some utilities. Um, there are cloud-based tools on here. Some have access to high-performance computing. Others are just run in a virtual machine, again, on the TAC or design safe side of the server. Um, bat, you can run these tools in kind of just a batch mode. You just start running and then come back later. Uh, see the results, or you, there's an interactive component where some tools are interactive and you want to see things on the screen and get a remote desktop and run through the tool. So we have different tools that work in different ways. And importantly, as I mentioned earlier, access to the data depot uh, files. So we have this data depot browser. You can look at my data, you can look at your projects, you can look at published projects, you can look at community data, and the files will come down. And we're working to improve this interface right now uh, so that you can also search. Right now, you can only search within the official data depot uh, side of things. But here, you may need to search for specific files. So that's something that we're going to be improving over the next year as well. Um, one thing that we are really going to emphasize in Design Safe, what I call Design Safe 2.0, is Jupyter. And you've if you've heard me talk, you've heard me coo and ooh and ah about Jupiter and what it can do. And we're really going to push that to the limit in the next couple of years. Um, and so if you recall, Jupiter um, is kind of a, uh, I like to call it the electronic notebook we've been promised for decades. So we can have rich text code, all of this in the cloud running. Uh, you can run it locally too, but we can run Python scripts. Um, and so I'm going to show you some examples 
on how we're using Jupiter and how we want to be using Jupiter over the next couple of years. So I thought I'd mention that up front because I'm going to keep saying Jupiter uh, quite a lot. In fact, it's become a joke within Design Safe. Anyone has a problem, I say, I think Jupiter can do that. Um, oh, I forgot. I had a little screenshot to show you. So here's just an example again of a Jupiter notebook. This is when actually does some machine learning that my YAR put together. Uh, and you can see you can import data sets, you can see different data frames, you can do machine learning, you can do data analysis. There's just a ton that you can do with Jupiter. So let's focus first on some of the simulation codes and some of, in particular, the new simulation codes that are available. Um, you know, we've, since day one, we've had AdCERC, uh, OpenFoam, OpenSeas. Those were kind of our core three. Uh, we added LSDINA, which is a commercial code, which we can provide you access to if you have a commercial license. Um, and we have some new ones, you know, Dakota, Clawpack, Rwell, SW Batch, and just this week, ANSYS. Um, these are generally HPC enabled, so they can run on either Stampede 2 or Frontera. You can access them through the app, uh, through the portal, which is what, you know, you can look at these as apps. Um, but you can also, if you're very familiar, for instance, with OpenSeas and want to really, you know, have as much flexibility as possible, you can go, you can SSH into the command line of uh, Stampede 2 and run things there. And we can provide you easy access to an HPC allocation, not just for the CPUs um, in Stampe 2 and Frontera, but also GPUs and some of the other systems that we run um, through our own design safe allocation. But these are the three that I'm going to focus on next is um, ANSYS, SW Batch, and RWAIL. So we'll go from right to left. Um, so ANSYS, many people may be aware of uh, as a commercial code that provides, I mean, just a plethora of simulation solutions, you know, from mechanical, electrical, um, mostly our, our, our natural hazards crew will be uh, interested in structural and fluid, computational fluid dynamics. They do have a mechanical component that says pipelines, I know folks are using that as well. Um, we can give you access only obviously for non-commercial academic use. Uh, it can be run interactively or in the batch mode. Uh, and it's just currently being integrated into the workspace and linked to uh, the data depot. But it's currently available through the command line, also through the TAC Viz portal. Um, and here's just the link if you want to get a little bit more information. And just this morning, we actually provide a little bit more information uh, on Design Safe about how to access ANSYS. Uh, and we already have people who've been running about six months or a few months on this um, from UCLA. So we, we've already got some users from our community using ANSYS. RWAIL is actually a, a code and an app that was developed by the Sim Center. Uh, called Re and it stands for Regional Workflow for Hazard and Loss Estimation. Uh, it's a Python workflow management application. So uh, what you really are trying to do is run a regional loss uh, uh, hazard analysis and loss analysis, but trying to provide as much physics in each of the pieces along the way. So you can create and re run your own workflows using data that are in the data depot. Uh, the Sim Center tested and validated some of this as part of their regional test bed exercises. And at the Sim Center website, they have uh, at least three uh, webinar videos uh, explaining how, how RWAIL works. Um, so here's just an e example of, for instance, you might be looking at doing a loss estimate where you've got some generic buildings uh, developed based on BIM. You, you define the hazard from recorded ground motions, then you, do, you model the response using some multiple degree of freedom nonlinear systems, and then your losses are estimated with P, uh, FEMA P58. Um, but perhaps you also wanna see how the answer changes if you use simulated ground motions instead of recorded ground motions. Um, and so you can, you know, again, plug and play in each of these areas. Uh, so our whale 1.0 or really 1.1 is available in, uh, in the workspace under simulation. It only works on earthquake losses um, for now. Uh, their example inputs are actually provided under community data. And you can see here some of the inputs uh, for that Anchorage test bed. And I believe just this month, in the upcoming month, they're going to release RWAIL 2.0, which adds hurricanes, including wind, both wind and storm surge hazards, 
And, you know, I think our whale is one of the really exciting things that we can do where we can really do the best physics for these regional scale uh, loss estimates. So it's, it's, it's really gonna, I think, take off in the, in the next few years. Of course, when you do a regional assessment, uh, looking at an output file is not be the best way to look at the outputs. We need to visualize them. Uh, we can help you do that too. Uh, within our visualization tab, we have QGIS, an open GIS uh, uh, program. And you, know, you can look, for instance, at loss ratios in uh, the Oakland area, uh, say red tag buildings, uh, uh, moving a little bit further north uh, into Albany, et cetera. So this is all for San Francisco um, or a Hayward Fault uh, scenario. So again, trying to allow you to do this geospatial analysis in the cloud as well. Um, so that's it for our whale. So let's move on a little bit to SW Batch, uh, which is something that was developed by my colleague Brady Cox and his student Joe Van Tassel. If you're a geotech uh, and a geo or a geophysicist, you know what it means to invert surface wave dispersion data to get shear wave velocities. Uh, we, you know, we measure phase velocity versus frequency or wavelength shown by the black uh, bars. Then we have to figure out the velocity models that will match that. It's an ill-posed, non-unique problem. So you got to run millions and millions of profiles to see what fits. Um, and that's where we're able to help them um, use Stampede 2 and the open, soft, open source software Geopsy to do this. Uh, and you know, it has to batch, obviously, to run millions and millions of, of, of models. But what they were able to do, and this is what I'm excited, I'm going to build more on this, is the fact that they could do it all within a Jupyter notebook. So they developed a Python package SW pre-post for the pre and post processing. They can even send their jobs to Stampede in the Jupyter notebook. So that is important uh, too. So I'm gonna follow up on this, but the key is look what Jupyter can do. We can not only develop inputs, we can run jobs, we can post process, we can do a lot with Jupyter. Um, I did want to mention one other thing that we also just released and real, by uh, Brady and Joe as well. Uh, if you do hor horizontal to vertical spectral ratios for site characterization, um, they also have a web app available called HBR, HBSR Web, and the URL is here. Um, so let's move on and talk about visualization. Um, and so there's a couple of new things in the last year, uh, two related to open seas, STKO and GID, and then some enhancements to our mapping software uh, for geospatial data, HasMapper. We call it HasMapper 2.0. So if you're aware, STK, STKO stands for the Scientific Toolkit for Open Seas. Uh, it is a commercial program out of uh, Italy. And it's, again, it's provided for non-commercial academic use from Estea Software. And it allows you, it's a GUI for pre and post processing specifically of Open Seas models and results. So it's specific to Open Seas. You can customize and manipulate model inputs and outputs with a uh, Python scripting interface that they've developed. So it really helps, particularly for those models, the geotech models, 2 and 3D, or this type of soil structure interaction model, um, where things you just have to visualize. So uh, last November, they gave a webinar, and that is still archived in our YouTube channel if you want to learn more about STKO. Uh, GID is another tool that uh, has similar capabilities, but it is not specific to open seas. So um, again, GID is provided a, in term, uh, for non-commercial academic use. It's a universal pre and post processor for numerical simulations, but it has been used a lot um, by uh, the geotechnical community to model, op uh, to develop and visualize open seas results. Uh, really, Pedro Arduino and and McCann have really been involved with that. There's more information on the Open Seas Wiki about using GID. Uh, and this was just released uh, uh, just in the last week or so. Um, so that is also available to help you make your models and then you can still, and you can run them again uh, on Design Safe after you've created the models and you can use this for the visualization after you've run the results. Moving on to HazMapper, um, uh, if, You've looked at this before. This is our interactive map viewer. Um, I like to call it the, the Google Maps or the Google Earth, uh, the poor man's Google Earth or Google Maps 
It doesn't have all those bells and whistles, but it has a lot of the bells and whistles we need. And in fact, now it has even more. So you can put in images, uh, GPS tracks, point clouds, videos, GeoJSON, all of it in one map. Uh, last April, we did a webinar on, uh, and my PR did that, in fact, on uh, the HasMapper 2.0 enhancements, and we updated the documentation soon after in June. Just to give you a kind of closer look, you know, you up here, you create and open the map. What's really great now is this assets area. So those are the files that are incorporated in the map, the, the, the picture of the images, the GPS tracks. Another great thing is linking to point clouds. And so, you know, you may do a LIDAR point cloud, but people want to know where it was taken and they want to be able to quickly visualize it. We can do that there. Uh, you can control whether the base map is a satellite or roads. Um, there's different filters for the displayed assets. You can manage who has access to the map. And then ultimately you can publish the map. Um, and, and in fact, we even give the Latin launch of your mouse as you're moving around all the things that people have asked for through the years. So here's just an example from the assets. You know, you, you can click on either the picture, you know, the little camera, or you can click on the name of the file, shows you where it is. Uh, you see the image over here, any metadata associated with it is shown and you can download it. Similarly, say for point cloud. So you, you can show, the, we'll show where the point cloud represents. Um, so the location is indicated here. It's previewed over here. And if you hit view, it'll link to Poetry. I mean, you have to set it up for Poetry as a viewer, but it'll automatically go to that Poetry viewer. So it makes it a lot easier to find those uh, Poetry files and those uh, uh, 3D point files. So let me finish up with some kind of a little bit more of a path forward in, in what we're planning over the next short term couple of years, let's say. So we can look at the design safe science plan as trying to serve the Near East science plan, which has many important components. These are the five main components, looking at loading, simulation, recovery, mitigation actions, and, and sharing data. Some of these are obviously design safe related, but in fact, all of them could utilize, could take advantage of big data, cloud-based tools, HPC resources. And so our goal is really to provide you the ability to do transformative research workflows. So, you know, if you watch this seminar or this webinar last year, I kind of talked about an example of research workflow that used lots of tools that we had. We ran ad search for storm surge. We used Kalpana to, to convert the output to uh, shape files and we brought it into QGIS. Then in Jupiter, we did some analysis on the DEM and the residences, and we put it all together and we identified the inundated residences uh, from the storm surge analysis. But this is all kind of manual, right? I got to find this tool, that tool, this tool, and link them together. What if we could do it all in one place? And that's where we see Jupiter heading for us as being our main workflow engine. Because Jupiter provides a simple, but still flexible environment to utilize Python to develop these workflows. It's less complex than the command line, so rather having trying to go to Stampede 2 and doing all this work, but it's more flexible than the portal apps that we have. So our, in, our, in our vision, the workflow process would be something similar, like I mentioned, for SW Batch. You can pre-process the inputs required for whatever you're doing in Jupyter, then our API, which used to be called Agave, and I know don't get scared by the three letters API. Um, it's, 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 it's not too hard to use. Um, so it used to be called Agave, now it's called Tapas. And so within Jupyter, you can use the Tapas API to submit jobs to the high performance computing um, cluster from Jupyter. So you kind of send it off to the oven, wait for it to cook, come back to Jupyter, and post-process the outputs. And in fact, that's exactly how SW Batch has been implemented in a Jupyter notebook that's available from, uh, again, Joe Van Tassel and Brady Cox. So, you know, they developed a workflow and published it, and this was just how to do surface wave inversion in a journal article, but someone else trying to do that workflow would be almost impossible to do from scratch. So they have worked with us to the, we developed the portal app. They developed this SW pre-post Python package that they can use within a Jupyter workflow. 
And in fact, they have on GitHub example Jupyter notebooks that are built to be used with DesignSafe where you can do the pre-processing. Now this is where you submit the job. It gets a little bit complex, but not insurmountable. And then the post-processing. All can be done in a Jupyter notebook. And you can take their, their notebook, bring it into DesignSafe, modify it for what you want to do. And so, um, and that's, you can get to that um, from the SW batch documentation link that is um, available from, from the link, from, um, from the tool, from the app page for SW batch. So we, we have to take these Jupyter workflows to the next level. Our team is developing several example use cases with people in our community. Clint Dawson uh, is working on one that uses AdCirc. Asan Karim is developing one using OpenFoam. Pedro Arduino with OpenSeas. Myself with my uh, postdoc, Young Q Cho on LS Dyna. And the Sim Center is looking at how they can take the RWELL workflow and put it into a Jupyter notebook as well. So if you're interested more in this, and the first step is probably to, to, to attend our October webinar on Jupiter, Tapas, and Tapas Pi. Um, and so keep your eye out for that. And uh, we're also planning a research webinar, webinar specifically on SW Batch sometime this fall and winter. I still have to schedule that with Brady and Joe. Okay. Um, Last couple of things, uh, I would be remiss in this day and age to not mention AI and machine learning, which you know you can say are algorithms that learn without explicitly having to program them. You know, they're well suited to capture complex relationships, but the key is always the data. Uh, you need enough data to sample the range of the inputs, the outputs, the relationships. So do we have enough data in our field? Do the results make physical sense? Can we embed some of our the known physics into these models? These are a lot of the research questions that we have as we try to apply these to natural hazards. I will say I have for years been skeptical of anything that says neural networks in the name, um, but I have been swayed. Maybe it's because I've been working with TAC so long, um, but this is the quote that I love. Um, from Dave Womble at Oak Ridge National Lab, which was actually adopted from a Microsoft report we shouldn't be scared that AI will replace the scientist because AI won't replace the scientist, but scientists who use AI may replace those who don't. So think about how you can take advantage of these uh, in your research. And we're trying to enable that. We had a workshop last February, right before the shutdown, basically mid-February, um, where we tried to explore the research agenda regarding the use of AI, and that includes machine learning, deep learning, uh, in natural hazards research. Uh, the key findings are here, perhaps nothing earth shattering. Yes, we need to formally publish data sets that people can use in AI. We need to develop those AI skills within our community. Uh, there are some areas where they're really ready to take advantage of AI, others it may be a little bit further off. And of course we feel that cyber infrastructure will play an important role um, in facilitating AI. So our workshop report is, is published in DesignSafe. Here's the DOI. And actually the entire workshop, all of the presentations are available on the DesignSafe YouTube channel if you wanna take a look. Associated with the workshop, we had a half day boot camp the day before, which was focused on how you can use these tools in uh, using DesignSafe. We talked about scikit-learn, PyTorch, Keras, and TensorFlow, all scripted within Jupyter. <clears throat> and in fact, we we did not only use our typical Jupyter hub, which is built on a VM container, but we actually have a Jupyter hub or a Jupyter instance installed on a GPU compute node to take advantage of some of those uh, high-end computations needed, say, for different types of neural networks. The boot camp included some example Jupyter scripts and applications. <clears throat> One. One related to using Hurricane Harvey damage data to come up with a classification technique based on building type, wind speed. Uh, that was done using machine learning. As part of it is shown over here. And um, that was just done in scikit-learn. Um, and then we also took some image damage, images of damage from Hurricane Harvey and trained a convolutional neural network. That one uses the GPU compute node uh, we have an example um, notebook for that as well. And this is all available in community data. 
under machine learning boot camp. So if you want to take a look at those, you can try and run them yourself. A couple of last thoughts on new initiatives um, moving forward over the next year. We are going to uh, inaugurate a data set award um, where we will award, we will present this award, the best published data set or data sets, we're still working through the details, that have been published over the last year. And we're currently developing the selection criteria, but our tentative deadline is May. So if you have a data set that you're interested in, uh, in publishing and be considered for that award, keep that May date in mind. Um, next summer, knock on wood, we will be able to get together in person and we will be able to inaugurate our Design Safe Cyber Infrastructure Institute which uh, is going to be a week-long in-residence program at TAC. So graduate students who are using cyber infrastructure postdocs can come, will have activities, they can interact with the Design Safe staff, they can interact with each other and get some hands-on training and really deep training to really take it full advantage of cyber infrastructure. And then I kind of mentioned this already, one way that we want to introduce the capabilities of Design Safe is showing what type of research has been utilized by Design Safe. We're beyond the idea of, well, you could do this, you could do that. Let's see what people actually are doing. So, so you know, going through what surface wave inversions, what can be done in that field um, will be an important way to promote some of the things that we're doing. And we'll have other research webinars on different topics uh, across the year. So the Learning Center is the place where all this can be found. So you can see our tutorials. And again, they are all archived on our YouTube channel. You can see here's the, the, the workshop. And we actually, the, we took that boot camp and we actually did a two-part webinar in April, Sim Center webinars, uh, workshops even from the experimental facilities are all there in the Learning Center. These are the upcoming webinars you should keep your eye out for. I already mentioned introdu introduction to Jupyter and Tapas Pi. Um, we've got user experiences in data publishing and something hopefully on open phone come December. Um, and this is my last slide. I do want to mention we are here for you. Um, we are here not only providing the tools and the capabilities that are currently in Design Safe, but we'd love to hear if you something interesting that you want to try and you're not sure how to do it, we might be able to help you. So just keep in mind that we are here for you, um, whether you're funded by NSF, whether you're not, okay? Uh, you can interact with us so many ways. Um, you can send a, a support ticket. Um, I get a copy of every one and I make sure that uh, I look for things that might be more bigger and more interesting than just say, Ooh, we have a problem, I'm, I want to task people to help you. Um, you all, we also have Design Safe Slack. Um, if you have joined Design Safe, you will get an invite to join Slack. You may not realize that what that means, but it's basically an instant messaging um, and, and um, collaboration tool that is really helpful. And you can not only interact with Design Safe staff, but also the whole Design Safe community. Okay, um, I always end saying, please cite data using DOIs in your reference list. That's my number one training thing for today. And one other thing that we ask you to do is if you use Design Safe in your research, yes, cite the data in the DOI, but also cite our marker paper. It helps us track research that we've enabled. And I'm always available by email and met or Slack or calls. Uh, to hear your feedback, your ideas, and your experiences, because we're really here to try and make this the best interface for you. So I'm going to stop there. And of course, I talked too long. Um, but we've got about 10 more minutes, and I will be see if there's any questions. Um, I see there were some stuff in the chat, but I don't know if I want to read it all. Um, is there anything that perhaps I I don't know, uh, Mike Yar, is there anything in this list that I, I may want to specifically? Um, um, yeah, I, can, uh, I, I guess there is a question uh, in regards to uh, the, uh, how, um, like there is um, Eduardo Smile uh, who is oh, asked. I see that. I got it. I got it. Thank you. So the last question from Eduardo, um, how can I collaborate as a Mexican researcher? If you are if you are doing natural hazards research, you just join and you and you can use it. 
we have researchers publishing data from New Zealand, Europe, Canada, et cetera. Um, and so uh, just talk to us. Um, publishing data is no problem. Using Jupyter is no problem. Using the portal apps is no problem. If you want to get an HPC allocation, um, as a non-US researcher, you simply need a US collaborator and we, we link you together um, in terms of the allocation and, you're, and you can be put on their allocation. So um, yes, we can even provide HPC access. Uh, it's just a little bit uh, more complicated for those overseas. Any other questions? Uh, okay, so Ramin asks, Hazmapper, is there, is there an app for this tool or only desktop based? Um, so yeah, it, it's more like Google Maps than it is Google Earth, right? So it runs in the web browser. Uh, so yeah, it would be nice to have an app to use it in the field. Um, so no, not necessarily, but I didn't mention this this year because I mentioned it last year, but if you use the wrap, the, uh, you know, the app that's developed by the Rapid, um, you can take all your data that were, was collected by that Wrap app and you can log in, you can log into the Wrap with your design safe credentials and you can then take all the data from Wrap under your name and shoot it to a project and then you could bring it into, um, you could bring it into Hazmap or once you're back at home. Lots of thank yous. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> ah, I see someone asking about uh, pre and post processing uh, to uh, for adser. Um, so you're you're parsing my you're getting to the depth of my knowledge of adser when you ask about adser depth grids. Um, I will, uh, you know, Clint Dawson is the one who has been working at CERC, obviously, and, and the AdCERC uh, workflow that they're working on is actually an inversion technique um, that requires a huge ensemble of AdCERC simulations that they then run in within their um, um, within their inversion process. But I can get him in touch with you. Um, and if I can make sure I get your contact information, Yuvala Sharma, um, I can get you. Um, I can get you in contact with him or one of his students um, about about that. Okay. I would love to see more adsurf uh, usage. That would be great. And we'll be trying to keep you up to date as we develop these use cases. Um, you know, if there's an ad circuit case that comes out, uh, Clint and his student will give a research webinar. Um, so I, I like to joke that we, we entice you with the research, but you get, we have to give you some spinach while you have all your cake too, um, because we want you to learn about design safe too. So you're more inspired to, to figure out how to use us in your research. So great. Thanks, Yuvala. I have your email. I will get that to you. Any other questions? Well, as I mentioned, if there's anything you wish was there but is not, um, send me a send me a note, and and we can look into it. We have lots of things on the pike, down the pike. But I, one of the best ways to get things to know what the researchers need is to hear about what the researchers want. And so we're very very responsive to helping you uh, reach your research goals. So I guess I'll end it there, unless others have. Uh, questions. I really appreciate your attendance and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thanks everybody. Bye.